every exam we start off with inspection, just looking at the placement of your ears, looking at the external canals for any uh, discharge, drainage, signs of infection, or inflammation. I'm going to perform the whisper test. Occlude, uh, you can either occlude the patient's ear or have the patient occlude their own ear. Occlude the ear and I'm going to whisper a common two-syllable phrase like apple or baseball and have Miley um, tell me what I said. Apple. Apple. Good. And then you'd repeat the same on the opposite ear. Baseball. Baseball. Very good. Next, I'm going to um, what, do what we call the tug test, where I take the pinna with my hand and just lightly tug back up and down on the oracle or the pinna. Uh, if there's any pain there, that can indicate some inflammation and possible infection in the internal canal. So always do the tug test before you go ahead and put the, um, the scope into the ear. Put on the speculum. You want to use the largest speculum that you can that will fit comfortably into the patient's ear. On adults, you'll pull up and back. With children, you'll pull down and back, and that will just straighten out the external canal. Pulling back and up on her ear, inserting the scope, and looking into her external canal and finding her tympanic membrane. Just going to take a look at this ear. And note how I'm bracing against, I'm pulling up and back with my left hand on her ear. With my right hand, the hand that has the otoscope with it, I'm bracing against the side of her face. I do this so that the scope isn't going to get out of my hand and jam into her ear, which is very uncomfortable. This is really important when you're seeing pediatric patients as they're constantly moving their heads and you don't want to cause any trauma to their external ear canal. When you're looking at the um, internal um, ear canal and finding the tympanic membrane, it's important to look at the um, specific structures of the tympanic membrane, including the bony prominences of the malleus, the handle of the malleus and the umbo, looking for the light reflex um, and all the different structures there, look, assessing for any redness. It should be a nice pearly white color, which yours were. Um, and if it was red or bulging, that can um, indicate some signs of infection how to perform the Rene and Weber hearing test. So there are three main types of hearing loss. There is sensory neural, which is a problem with the auditory nerve or the cochlea. And then there is conductive hearing loss. So conductive hearing loss occurs when sound waves cannot pass through the outer and middle ear. And there are two types of conductive hearing loss, air conduction and bone conduction. And then there is mixed hearing loss, which is a combination of sensory neural hearing loss and conductive hearing loss. So we're going to start with the Weber test, which evaluates for unilateral hearing loss or hearing loss in one ear. Okay, so to activate the tuning fork, you can strike it on the elbow or you can strike it on the knee. You don't wanna strike the tuning fork on a hard object such as a table because that can damage the tuning fork and it can produce overtones, which can affect the test results. So both the Weber and Renee test should be performed in a quiet room. Okay, so for the Weber test, after you activate the tuning fork, you're going to place it midline either on the top of the head here or on the forehead. And you're going to ask the patient if they hear the tone equally in both ears or if it's heard louder in one ear. A normal Weber test can be heard equally in both ears. So in sensory neural hearing loss, the sound will laterize to the unaffected ear, which means the tone will be heard louder in the good ear. If there is conductive hearing loss, the sound laterizes to the affected ear, which means the tone will be heard better in the poor ear or the one having the hearing loss. And so I can hear the tones equally in both ears, which is a normal Weber test. Okay, so next we're going to do the Rene test, which evaluates for conductive hearing loss in one ear. After performing the test on one ear, you do it again on the other ear. Okay, so to perform the Rene test, you're going to activate your tuning fork. Be careful not to touch these prongs once the tuning fork is activated. Just hold it by the stem here. You're going to place it on the mastoid bone and ask the patient when they can no longer hear the sound. At that point, you're going to move the tuning fork Hold it about one to two centimeters from the outer ear and ask them again when they can no longer hear the sound. So in a normal Rene test, which is also called a positive Rene test, air conduction is approximately twice as long as bone conduction.
Okay, so I can no longer hear the tone, so I'm going to bring it to the outer ear. And now I can no longer hear the sound. And that would be a normal Renee test in my right ear. Now we're going to do the left ear. So I'm gonna give my elbow a break and I'm gonna activate it on my knee. We're gonna hold it on the mastoid bone. So I can no longer hear it, so I'm going to move it to the outer ear. So the left ear is also normal or a positive Renee test, which means that air conduction is approximately two times that of bone conduction. So in an abnormal or negative Renee test, when you move the tuning fork in front of the ear, the patient will not be able to hear that tone because the patient cannot hear sound conducted through the air after the tuning fork is moved away from the mastoid bone. So in an abnormal Renee test, bone conduction is greater than air conduction. So the Romberg test assesses if the patient is swaying at all. So first, we'll just have them stand there and then just observe and see if they're swaying at all with their eyes open. And that looks pretty good here. So now, please close your eyes and we'll observe for swaying. What you can do is put your hands around the patient so in case they feel a little unsteady, in case they were to be a little bit wobbly, that you would be able to catch them. But in this case, there's no swaying, so that is normal, the normal Romberg.